Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our session. You made it to Saturday morning, and uh, you will not be disappointed in this session. Um, today, we have Laura Hill and Fred Ligon uh, from, uh, from the Historic Triangle of Virginia. If you've never been there, beautiful part of, uh, of Virginia down um, Tidewater. So um, let me just kind of briefly tell you what the, um, the, the session is going to be about. Then um, my name is Stephanie Sperling. I'm going to be the director lurking in the background. Um, I will help them with chat. Please put in the chat. You know, you know, Laura and Fred are from, you heard from the Historic Triangle of Virginia. I am coming to you from Chesapeake Beach, Maryland, just a couple of hundred miles north of where they are. Please put in the chat where you're from. Um, I'm sure Laura and Fred would love to hear that. So. The session this morning, I'm going to stop talking and get, get to the good stuff. The Historic Triangle of Virginia is a beautiful historic community that proudly holds the distinction of being the birthplace of America. Yet, below the surface, the community is the place where seeds of racism were planted 400 years ago. Today, our nation is choking on the bitter fruit these seeds produce. Very well said. This presentation will feature three local initiatives that are changing the narratives of the birthplace of America Williamsburg, Jamestown, and Yorktown, Virginia. So with that, I'm going to take myself off the screen and I'm going to give it to Laura and Fred and just let me know when you want that presentation to come up, Fred. All right. Absolutely. Good morning. We are so honored to be here today to share with you and also to participate in the Slave Dwelling Project's National Conference. It's such yeah. an honor. How are you doing today, Fred? I'm doing well, Laura. How are you? I'm excellent. We're going to begin with a PowerPoint demonstration, and Fred's going to get that up on the screen for us. We're, we'll be discussing the history of the historic triangle and how its roots are intertwined in the national narrative. All right. So this presentation is correcting the narrative of the birthplace of America. And okay, it's Fred, you're ready to go. Yep. It's, Thank you. It's presented by Coming to the Table. Coming to the Table, Historic Triangle. Now, Coming to the Table is a national racial reconciliation organization with more than 45 chapters nationwide. This, this presentation is presented by the 30th chapter, which focuses on Jamestown, Williamsburg, and Yorktown, Virginia. And as Stephanie said, the presenters for today are myself, Laura Hill, the founder and director of the Historic Triangle Chapter, and one of our valued leaders and facilitators, Mr. Fred Liggins. All right, welcome to the birthplace of America. Uh, many of you may know that America uh, has its roots in Jamestown. Jamestown is where the colonists arrived in 1607 and established the Virginia colony. We know that Williamsburg is the colonial capital of Virginia and Yorktown, Virginia is where the last battle of the Revolutionary War was fought in 1781. So we call Yorktown the place where independence was won. So it, it's very historically significant. Let's watch a, a, a video to learn more about the history. volume is I can't hear anything Fred let's start over still can't hear it 
I'm not sure you're going to be able to hear it because it looks like there's nothing on my end that's going to allow me to change the volume. I think it might be because we had to use the Firefox browser instead of the Chrome browser. So maybe you can just kind of talk us through what it's, yeah. what it's okay. talking about. Fred, you want to talk us through the first video? Yes, yes. Essentially, Williamsburg, being the historic triangle, uh, has become a living museum. And what that means, if you've ever visited Williamsburg, is everything is reenacted. Everything is dramatized and performed. Uh, the interesting and most compelling aspect of this beautiful place that Laura and I get to call home is that it's a story-rich community. It's, it's a community filled with stories, and we embody the stories that we tell through these dramatization and performances every day. And we tell these stories because they explain the legacies we inherit and define our sense of truth and self-understanding. And as we all know, stories how we make sense of the things that happen to us. Stories are our way of describing time, and we're formed by these stories, whether we know the story or not. And when we know the story, we can discover where we've been and where we're going. And that's essentially what you would learn in this video is how Yorktown, Jamestown, and Williamsburg seeks to dramatize the story of history. But, Laura? Yes, we know there is a forgotten history. In 1619, the first Africans were brought here. They were on a ship that was headed for Veracruz, Veracruz, Mexico. And the ship, they was attacked by pirates and the pirates brought them to Jamestown. Now we do know that these, these uh, Africans that were brought here they were brought here against their will. We also know that there were no slave laws in Virginia in 1619. It would be more than 40 years before slave laws were enacted. However, these first Africans, there were about uh, 20 of them, according to John Rolfe, who was the secretary for the Virginia Company of London. We know that these first Africans were not free that from the time they stepped off those ships there were plans put in motion to control their lives and to control their destinies so that forgotten history of our nation came to light in 2019 when we we commemorated the 400th anniversary Mm -hmm. of the arrival of the first Africans. Unfortunately, for some people, they were learning about these first Africans for the first time. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a history that has been forgotten. It has been intentionally um, hidden. Um, and we even today, we see efforts uh, in place to to hide the history of the Africans. We see this, this whole CRT movement that focuses on not talking about the country's racial history. But we do know that the founders of our nation, they talked about race and they talked about racial history and they even included it in our founding documents. So, we're going to now discuss uh, our the impact of this forgotten history. So in 1928, in Williamsburg City proper, uh, a particular white uh, clergyman made a deal with John D. Rockefeller to restore the, quote, old city, to restore Williamsburg, to create what has become known now as Colonial Williamsburg. And to make the vote, what the clergyman did is he held the vote for the town, for the city, in a whites-only school, thereby inevitably removing the voice of African-American members of the community, which resulted in the displacement of over 700 African-American peoples. Four neighborhood blocks in the city of Williamsburg that were primarily African-American turned into two blocks. Businesses were shut down. Things were replaced. Folks were displaced. 
See, the impact of this forgotten history is that it leaves the story in the hands of those who have the power. And the people who had the power were white brothers and sisters, white neighbors who could control the narrative. And controlling the narrative could mean the narrative could be shaped, even if it resulted in a false narrative. So for the longest time, Colonial Williamsburg never really told the history of any of our African-American neighbors and the resilience and the strength and the power and the successes. Instead, it was a false narrative that just continued to cultivate a racial divisiveness that ultimately has led to mistrust in our own community, which aligns, I think, historically, which inevitably led to segregation, which we know uh, when, when the voice, when voices of the oppressed, voices of the marginalized are unheard, as Dr. King said, riots become the language of the unheard as, as people began to feel threatened, um, as everyone began to feel threatened, we know that this has led to all forms of violence, whether it be verbal, emotional, or even physical violence, especially if the dominant narrative was being threatened by what is ultimately the truth. So the impact is significant, and it was held in the hands of those who had power to control the narrative. However, there is a solution and this solution really um, is the founding principles of coming to the table. Coming to the table is based on uncovering and acknowledging racial history. Also healing the racial wounds. If you had a broken bone in your body, there would not even be an option to leave it broken. We mm -hmm. understand that healing is a process and we also understand that racial healing is a process and we, we have to work towards our healing our nation's racial wounds because right now we are a fractured nation racially. Next, we have to build bridges across racial lines. One of coming to the table's visions is to, is also the vision of Dr. Martin Luther King when he said that, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would come to the table and sit down at the table of brotherhood. So. Fred and I represent that dream mm -hmm. and all of our coming to the table chapters represent bringing people, diverse groups of people together into the table. Also taking action to dismantle systems of oppression. It's not enough to have apologies. It's not enough to recognize the need for change, we have to take steps to, towards structural changes that will dismantle these systems that have disadvantaged and disenfranchised millions of Americans. Mm -hmm. So one initiative that's in place to help to change the narrative in the birthplace of America is our coming to the table local chapter. It was established in 2019. It's the 30th coming to the table group. Now they're in the two years since we've been established, we've had nearly 20 groups established. We are working with community leaders to change the narrative here. We've had opportunities to collaborate with the NAACP, we've worked with William and Mary, and we're currently working on an initiative with our local leaders in city council. So at Coming to the Table, what we're doing is we are bringing diverse groups of people to the table in our community. And what we do is we design programs so that people can feel free and to come and have a safe place to come and to have sometimes difficult and sometimes very uncomfortable 
conversations about race and the racial issues in our community. And I think one of the things that's significant about coming to the table is one of our struggles, it seems to me, at least in our in our nation, is we don't know how to talk to one another and we don't know how to disagree. And so coming to the table not only makes space for voices to come together, but it also becomes a way of, of, of real life human to human practice. We are formed together as we learn how to have these conversations. And for me, that's one of the most significant impulses of coming to the table is that it teaches us how to engage this conversation and then brings us together to come up with actual viable, actionable solutions. Initiative number two, heal Williamsburg, heal the nation. There is a saying here that as goes Virginia, so goes the nation. Well, we say in Williamsburg, as goes Williamsburg, so goes the nation. So our focus is to heal Williamsburg. And by healing our nation at its root, our goal is that it will reverberate and that we will see changes not only locally and statewide, but nationally as well. So every year we have a a rally. It's held in Colonial Williamsburg. Every year we sponsor this rally and we have different themes. Now our theme last year was re reparations and racial equity. And we invited community leaders to come out and to discuss what racial equity looked like and, and what reparations look like and reparative act look reparative acts look like in their organization. Well this year our theme for the 2021 rally is bridging the racial divide. So we will have community leaders, faith leaders, uh, city leaders come out and share with the community on what their organizations are doing to help us to heal and bridge the racial divide in our nation. And then finally, we have the Williamsburg Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Uh, Laura and I had the joy of being able to work with the mayor and the vice mayor and the city council in helping create and bring this particular resolution to life. As I mentioned earlier, Williamsburg is rooted in stories. And we are the story we tell ourselves. That's one of our one of our commitments. But we're also the silences we keep. So we believe that stories have to tell the truth. And then this moment of great divide, of which Williamsburg uh, and the Short Triangle as a whole has not been immune, we have to make sure that we're telling the truth because the vision cannot be overcome without the truth. The healing from the past harms of our collective story of racial hostility and injustice and how they presently impact the bodies, minds, and family systems of neighbors cannot happen without a courageous commitment to the truth and an unwavering pursuit of reconciliation. We have to reconcile the truth of our past if we're to uncover the truth of today and witness our community become a place where all can thrive. So a Truth and Reconciliation Committee's effort to uncover and acknowledge truths about Williamsburg history, we believe will make healing possible for Williamsburg's present and future for generations to come, especially if we value the truthfulness of the stories we tell about ourselves. It's, it's a good and necessary uh, first step. And it advances our city's goals and some of the commitments that our city outlined. And so the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, as we framed it here, following the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's models and framework, um, embraces what's called a restorative justice framework. It's an actual way of practicing, uh, engaging and community organizing and bringing conversations together. If you're not as familiar with restorative justice as a framework, I encourage you to look it up. But it's committed to three predominant pillars. Uh, one is to uncover uh, one is to uncover the harms. So a truth and reconciliation committee will dig deep into the archives and deal with interviews and uncover the harms that were created due to racial injustice, particularly for those of African-American ancestry. And then the pillar number two is that the harms reveal obligations and needs. And so then the Truth and Reconciliation Committee will start outlining, based upon what they learn, the needs and the obligations that are created. How did it impact economically in terms of education, in terms of resource, in terms of upward mobility, 
and sustainability. Uh, and then number three, it brings all parties, all stakeholders together. It's a victim-centered approach, restorative justice, but it recognizes that healing doesn't happen until all are liberated. So there is a sense where those who participated in the injustice and the descendants of those come together with the descendants of those who were uh, treated unjust and come together together uh, to participate in some sort of viable solution that brings about the necessary change, some sort of reparative or restorative act. And as you would imagine, that's where the hard work's going to be. The hard work's going to be how do we get the stakeholders together to see the harms, to then recognize and accept the needs and the obligations, and then how do we come together, all of us, to address these in a restorative and reparative way. And so we're excited about the Truth and Reconciliation Committee because it's an historical move um, because our city council established this formally with a resolution. There's not been anything like it, but it's a significant move that time will tell the outcome. Absolutely. So it is, as Fred said, the first ever Williamsburg Truth and Reconciliation Committee fully endorsed by our city leaders and city council. And I'm very proud to serve on this committee with other community leaders in our city. Mm -hmm. All right, well now we've shared with you the history of our community and how it intersects with the national history. We've also shared with you some of the problems um, that have come from false narratives and the impact that it's had on our community, as well as solutions and some of the initiatives that we are undertaking to correct the historical narrative here. Now we have an opportunity for you to ask any questions that you may have of Fred or, or me. And while we wait for any questions to come, I just want to say to Shelly and Angela, first, I want to welcome everybody because now I can see the I can see the chat. I couldn't. I was hidden behind the presentation. <laughs> but Shelly and Angela, yes, three cheers for CTT um, coming to the table really is and can be and should be uh, a safe place to learn to have to have this conversation. So uh, I'm grateful for the opportunities that coming to the table presents as well. So do we have any questions about anything, any one of the three initiatives that we are seeking to work out here? in the historic triangle. I feel like we should have like Jeopardy music or like some sort of like <laughs> waiting background music right now as we wait. Oh, I see something. Anything coming up? Yes, is there any discussion on Palatan and natives who existed with African people? Laura, you wanna, you wanna tackle that? Okay, yes. At coming to the table, first of all, we we value all or all groups of people, particularly people who have been oppressed and in our nation. But the focus of of coming to the table is on the relationship between this the sons and daughters of former slaves and the sons and daughters of former slave owners. So. Our focus is on mending that relationship and acknowledging the impact of slavery and all forms of racism that slavery spawned. So while we acknowledge the Native Americans, the indigenous people, we acknowledge the fact that we, we the land that we call home was once their home and we, we acknowledge that, but our focus is on improving relations and, and uncovering the history of African-Americans and European-Americans. Yeah, and I would add, as, as much as I love my home here in Williamsburg, Virginia, one of the things that you see with the false narratives, when you looked at the impact, uh, the impact of what has taken place within the African-American community story is the same impact that's taking place within indigenous people's story. If you drive through the parkway in Colonial Parkway and you'll see the signs and the markers that attempt to tell the stories of some of the battles and wars, they're always, as you would imagine, they're biased 
right? Like they're tilted toward victimizing um, the, the colonists uh, and, and, and not the other way around. So there's work to do. It's, and then you all know this, right? So you have to, we have to correct the narrative of, of less correcting the narrative of one particular enslaved group and more correcting the narrative of power and how it was distributed with the colonialism. Uh, and so it, there's, there's a lot of retelling that's going to have to be done. Right. Thank you, Fred. Now, Shelley has a great question. Um, if there were no slave laws in place when the 20 and odd Negroes arrived in Hampton, how do we say they were enslaved? Well, first of all, we know that there was something called de facto slavery. Mm -hmm. um, we, we say enslaved because they, they were not free <laughs> in the sense that they did not control their lives and destin destinies. When the first Africans arrived, there was a, an indentured servant system in place. And the English uh, colonists, many of them who came under, came over under the indentured servitude system. Um, they had contracts that spelled out when their indentured servitude ended. And it also spelled out what they would uh, receive after their uh, contract expired. Some of them had the option to go back to England. Some stayed and were given land and they were able to grow tobacco and continue living a life as you know, free um, Americans, I guess. But the Africans didn't have um, Many of them did not have that opportunity. Some of some of the Africans were able to uh, work. They were able to. Um, at some point, we know that some of them owned land, so they they may have had. Um, they may have been in a situation where they were able to negotiate a contract where they were able to buy their freedom and they were able to own land. We know that there was one um, formerly, in, uh, well, we say enslaved, but it was de facto slavery up until the 1660s. We know that uh, one man, Anthony Johnson, is going to end up with over 500 acres of land. Um, he lived on the eastern shore of Virginia. So, we say that they were enslaved because we know that they were not free, um, that they owed a debt. They were exchanged for, they were traded for food and supplies. So they, they owed a debt to the Virginia Company of London and they were working off their debt. So that that's why I use the term enslaved, but there we really don't know um, their status because there were there were no slave laws, but we do know that they were not free initially. Yeah, and we also know that as time as time moved on, as laws may have been passed, other acts and policies were passed to specifically establish a permanent underclass in American society, which included those of African ancestry. So you think even all the way to the Racial Integrity Act, which obviously included a lot of different things, but you can just see the unwinding of how this narrative works. Even when laws are passed to seemingly correct a system, there's always seems to have been ways, even when you look in the 40s, 50s, and 60s of 1900, where we've always been able to create more of a, to continue to sustain a permanent underclass. You think about the racial composition rule of FDR's New Deal, or you think about redlining. So this narrative of there may be laws, but there's also policies and then there's also other hidden ways that we continue to perpetuate this kind of inequality and racial injustice. So let's see here, question. Um, could you say more about practical measures or initiatives from Louis, uh, Louis is it, I, I apologize, Louis, if I say your name incorrectly. Um, but could you say more about what practical measures or initiatives the TNR committee is focusing on?
Laura, you want to tackle some of that? Oh, okay. Um, the TNR, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, um, the resolution indicates that we are focusing on the impact of systemic racism, racial injustices, and the history of slavery um, and how it has impacted the city of Williamsburg. So those are three primary areas that we're going to focus on. As far as what measures we're going to take, we haven't gotten that far yet. So far we've had one meeting. <laughs> so we are, um, we're, you know, just it, this resolution was passed in July of 2021 and we had our first meeting in September. Yeah, and I would say that a Truth and Reconciliation Committee spends a great deal of its time putting together the truth, like uncovering the truth. So there'll be archival work. There'll be a lot of research. There'll be a lot of one-to-one -one interviews with people who have lengthy histories of descendancy here. So there will be a lot of time. Remember, the three pillars is, is to uncover the harms, then to uncover the obligations and needs, and then bring people together. So it's a very fair question. A lot of people want to know, what's the actionable measure? What are we trying to have as an outcome? Well, to uncover and tell the real truth and to lay out the steps toward restorative reconciliation. Um, mm -hmm. or at least, and, and I know reconciliation carries a lot of baggage with it, but to bring about what needs to be done to address the harms and the needs that the truth created. So it's a long, slow process. And that's the one thing we've said is it's, it's a process. Um, and so it's going to take time. But it's a great question. I look forward to seeing what the outcomes are. Okay. Ron Days has a question, and I think he's one of my fellow Hamptonians, <laughs> but um, Hampton University graduates. He asks, what has been the initial pushback and in attempts to engage audiences? Fred, you want to take that one? Yeah, I think, well, frankly, uh, Ron, we were surprised that there was no pushback in the resolution. Uh, we came out with supporters. Um, and, and if you're talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, and if you're talking about something broader, then we can speak to that too. But specific to the TRC, we expected a sense of pushback, but it was unanimously voted by the city council. Um, there was a round of applause by those who were in the audience that night at the resolution. And there was zero pushback on the actual resolution. And if you were to read the resolution, the language is as strong as the language could be. Uh, matter of fact, the language in the resolution would be considered um, flashpoint language within the whole critical race theory conversation. So we're very grateful that the so far the uh, welcome of this effort has been at least seemingly welcomed, um, or at least the detractors aren't pushing back quite as much just yet, but I am sure that will change. Well, one thing that we have seen, Ron, is uh, there there have been social media posts as well, been, yeah. as, well as uh, people who have written to the local paper. And basically they, they want information. Some of them just have questions about what exactly this TRC is going to accomplish. So there's always um, for some people a fear of the unknown and so we, we've heard comments like that. Well, you know, what are you going to do different? And what what is all of this going to amount to? And and is this a waste of taxpayer money? So we've heard some comments like that from the community. But as far as the leadership of our community, they have showed courage and they have supported this 100 percent. Yeah. And somebody had mentioned um, earlier, and I just want to acknowledge it because I want to I want to say yes to it. Um, uh, yes, that many indigenous people are mixed with African Americans, and the knowing of your roots is important, don't you think? Absolutely, it is. Uh, and and it's hard because, as as we all know, the history is complex. I mean, and when you look at the even the slave laws, and you look at 1705. Um, when the act defined that all slaves in Virginia were property, that included uh, not just uh, folks of Afri African descent, but it included mulatto and Indian slaves. 
So the the social descriptions of slaves uh, and enslavement in our country's uh, story, and specifically in Virginia's story, evolves and expands. So there's no question uh, that that there's going to be a lot of of tethering and tying together of the roots. The hope, the hope is that uncovering the fact that the truth had been somewhat hidden or at the very least whitewashed um, will unearth greater conversations that need to take place um, where all stories of all ancestry uh, are told with the truth. That's the hope. Absolutely. Okay, Sarah has a question. Um, she asks, is Colonial Williamsburg a part of this as well? And this is a initiative of the city of Williamsburg. However, the city leaders in, in selecting members of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, they looked for people who were, or organizations and people who were stakeholders in the community. So although Colonial Williamsburg is not, this is not an initiative of Colonial Williamsburg, there is some representation on the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Yeah, yeah. And Sarah, we'd love to have you uh, join us at Coming to the Table anytime, anytime. We, you'll, see, you'll see both Laura and I there. Yes, um, and also come to the Heal Williamsburg, Heal, Heal yes. the Nation rally, which is three weeks from today at Colonial Williamsburg. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, two, two more things uh, that we see here, Brigida, uh, and again, I apologize if I didn't get your name correct. Do you feel that it's important to share information about the Africans, both free and enslaved, who came to North America in the 1500s in the La Florida uh, colony? Yes, I would say yes, I do. I also believe it's all important to talk about the doctrine of discovery of 1452 that preceded even that, that gave permission to overtake whatever lands um, needed to be overtaken in the name of, of religion. And to begin the work of really, I mean, colonialism and triumphalism really began in 1452 with that papal bull that allowed uh, the westward expansion to enslave all initial inhabitants of the lands. So I would say yes to your question. I would say yes, even going back farther than that to 1452 and even going back farther to that um, into the 10th century where other laws were passed that, again, lifted up Euro-Anglo peoples. Uh, to be a d predominant ethnic superior class or a class of ethnic superiority. Uh, so, yeah, th and that's the thing. When you think about this, the narrative just unwinds and unwinds and unwinds. Uh, there's a lot to correct, for sure. Um, sure. Shelly Murphy asked a question, Laura, correcting the narrative. How much are the local folks, African-Americans, involved? Well, there is tremendous involvement with coming to the table. Um, also, we have uh, African-American facilitators and, and members of our group, as well as members of our leadership team. Also, we are all about reaching out and crossing racial lines and collaborating with other community organizations. So we have worked on projects with, as I said, the NAACP, but also one of the largest and oldest free black settlements in the nation is in James City County. And we've worked with them on Black History Month programs. Uh, we Again, we work with the city leaders and we have uh, also a uh, nonprofit organizations such as uh, one group that deals with uh, racial equity in the school system. So we're always working with other organizations and we're crossing racial lines. So we have a really diverse group and a very diverse team. And I'm very, yeah. really appreciative of that. Yeah. Okay. Carolyn, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Laura. Uh, Kathleen Frazier had a uh, question. Um, how do you respond to participants who take issues with addressing historical figures who are perceived as virtuous and without flaw, but in your lecture, <laughs> the information is revealing that those figures contributed. Okay, well, one of the 
things that I'm really happy about is that not only in Williamsburg and you know James City County and Yorktown, but nationwide, there has been a, a move to tell the truth about historical figures, beloved historical figures. Um, and we're seeing monuments taken down. Uh, we're seeing names of our colleges and universities and our schools being changed because of the um, people who were being honored have ties to the Confederacy and slavery. So we are about uncovering um, history. And some of it is not, <laughs> is, is, is uncomfortable for people. Um, in fact, in Richmond, we know they just took down the uh, Robert E. Lee monument that had been up for over a hundred years. So we are um, addressing historical figures here and we're uprooting um, the false narratives and we're replacing them with correct narratives. Well, and I would also, I might even add that it's hard. It's hard when revered stories of figures, revered figures have been almost seemingly romanticized and there's a sentimental attachment to these narratives. Um, but the fact that, as, and this is just my opinion, it's hard to deconstruct any of that when we are also a society that that romanticizes or at least sentimentalizes violence as a whole. Uh, and so it's hard to see any kind of moral wrong, I think, sometimes as a larger society, because there are other there are other wrongs and harms that have been created that we have somehow justified. And so we live in a society that justifies largely justifies all forms of violence at times. And in doing so, we're going to lift up certain figures even beyond their own story, even beyond their own narrative and turn away from some of the more harmful realities that exist in our historical narrative. And I think what the truth tries to do is put the whole thing together. There's just a, a larger composite of truth that we're trying to tell. Um, you know, I had one African-American pastor uh, colleague of mine say, Fred, you were born on the right side of the ledger. You didn't create the ledger, but you were born on the right side of the ledger and you need to do something about that. Um, how, how do you change the ledger? And so I think there is a there is a way it goes back to what we said earlier. We are the story we tell ourselves and there's none of I'm going to go out on a limb. I don't know about all of y'all, um, but I know my life isn't perfect. Um, and I don't necessarily want people telling my imperfect parts of my story and my homecoming service or my funeral or my memorial or whatever you have. But my I, I, the whole truth of who I am needs to be told to understand fully who I am. And I think that's the case with history. We need to re-embrace the good, the bad and the ugly or we will continue to repeat what it is we're ignoring. All right. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Carolyn Evans asked a question. Um, she she says, servants, why are black slaves referred to as servants? Um, and I'm, I'm just trying to understand the context of this and I'm hoping that she is implying um, the, the first and early Africans that were here um, in 1619 um, and you know, prior to the slave laws being codified in the 1660s. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that's what she's referring to. Um, because, again, absent of slave laws, it's very difficult to say what the legal status of these uh, first Africans were. Uh, we know that many of them were not free to control their lives and destinies. Um, they did not have a contract um, as the English indentured servants had. So, um, you know, I know at Colonial Williamsburg, uh, some of the narratives that I've seen there, they have referred to them as servants. And I think it's, I think it's about semantics. <laughs> you know, they would, Maybe it's, you know, the word servants may sound better than to say that these buildings were built by 
enslaved people. Yeah. <laughs> so they, were, they say they were built by the servants. <laughs> And Shelly, I want to acknowledge, Laura and I would agree with you that there is a bit of incorrect narrative from the organizations such as Jamestown and Williamsburg in the narrative. And I do believe that some are trying to retell that story. Just within the last two years, more centering has started to take place of African-American narratives. All right. Well, thank you so much, Fred. And thank you all for participating in this session today. Uh, we, When we saw that we were last, we thought, oh, wow. <laughs> They're saving the best for last. And we, <laughs> <laughs> we hope that you agree with us and we thank you for coming out and joining us today. And we're very thankful for the Slave Dwelling Project and yes. we support your efforts 100%. Yes. Thank you all for Everybody. joining us. Goodbye. Bye-bye.